Hello and welcome. My name is Samuel Vari, and this is the first episode of many where I interview people about faith, science, and magic. In this first episode, I have the help of my friend um, Anders Hesselboom, who's a Swedish skeptic and atheist. It's a pleasure to have you here with us tonight, and could you just, for record's sake, introduce yourself? Thank you. Uh, my name is Kenneth Miller. I am professor of biology at Brown University, which is in the city of Providence in the state of Rhode Island in the USA. I'm happy to be interviewed. We are very happy to have you here, and deeply honored both Anders and myself and Daniel that couldn't be here with us today. Great honor to have you here at Borgemestana. Thank you very much. For me as an atheist, the evolution theory makes perfect sense, but I'm sure you've heard all the arguments why evolution is atheistic. But how does it fit in a Christian worldview? How can evolution be a natural process if God is behind it? Well, I think that if one looks into traditional Christian philosophy, beginning with St. Augustine, and also with St. Thomas Aquinas, you will see an appreciation of the fact that God is the author of all things natural. Therefore, showing that something has a natural cause, whether it's the apparent movement of the sun across the sky, or whether it's the rising and falling of the tides, doesn't take God out of the picture. And I have to say, I feel the same way about the evolutionary process. A fair question for a Christian to ask an atheist is, why do we live in a universe that is simply overflowing with evolutionary possibilities for life? And one answer, and I suppose this is the answer of the atheist, is, well, that's just the way it is. I think the answer of the Christian is the reason the evolutionary process exists, the reason life is so extravagant and so beautiful, is because we live in a world that was fashioned by an intelligent creator who intended to have a process of evolution that would give rise to the beauty and the diversity of life, our own species included. So that is how I see it fitting into my Christian belief. But what then is the problem of believing that uh, we are handmade by God in our current form? Well, the problem in believing that we have been made directly by God in our current form is that the evidence contradicts it. And specifically what we see is that, first of all, we are built out of the same material as every other living thing, the same DNA, the same cellular structure, the same skeletal structure as all other vertebrates, and the same body structure as our close primate relatives. The second problem is that the fossil record, the geological history of this planet, shows that our species did not appear suddenly, but rather, just like every other species on this planet, we appeared over tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years by a process of evolution, by a process of descent with modification from earlier species. So I think that you know, the application of scientific rationalism shows that we were not handmade, as you put it, but rather we are products of the evolutionary process. And I think any form of religious belief has to recognize the validity of science and the scientific process. And that's what science currently tells us about our origins as a species. Why do them fundamentalists attack the theory of evolution rather than other theories that they don't either accept, like uh, cosmology and uh, geology holds uh, theories that also contradict the Bible? So why do they attack the theory of evolution? Well, the truth is, at least in my country, they attack geology too. Um, and they, they also attack the Big Bang Theory of cosmology. But I think that the reason that evolution has a special place is 
for the same reason that you can go into a bar or a pub and start a fight by saying something about somebody's mother. And, and that is that evolution tells us where we came from. It tells us who we are. And for many people, that is a profoundly personal statement. And in many respects, Christians might say, fundamentalist Christians in particular, that evolution questions the authority of the Bible. And I certainly understand that point of view. But I think more important to most Christians who reject evolution is that evolution suggests that we are not that special, that we are part of the living world around us, and that we emerged with that living world. Now, I find that message refreshing. I find it exhilarating. But I do know that many Christians find that to be depressing. They, as they put it to me, they don't want to believe that they are just animals. And I think that's one of the main problems that many people, uh, not just in the United States, but also in European countries have when they think about the implications of the theory of evolution. Concerning the similarities in the chromosomes between chimpanzees and humans, Miller, you have said that you don't believe in a deceptive God. Why isn't it obvious that he, God, is behind creation or the evolution? Why have God created the world in a, such a way that it is so simple to believe that the creation is made without a God? I think what, what the question asks has an assumption. And the assumption is that if God were real, he would have created a universe that requires his constant intervention. In other words, that we would see the hand of God every day. I find that to be a strange sentiment. It's a lot like saying, if an engineer were competent, if a designer were competent, he would have built an automobile that requires him to fix the engine every 10 or 20 kilometers. Instead, what I see is a creator who fashioned a natural world that works so beautifully that his own laws enable it to sustain itself, to evolve life, and to enable that life to evolve into a wide variety of forms and functions, ourselves included. I think it is, it is true that the atheist might say that the universe works just fine without God. And I agree with that. And so do a large number of other Christian thinkers. But the fact that the universe works well is certainly not an answer to the question of why it works so well, why the laws of nature are so favorable to life, and why the natural world was eventually able to in evolve intelligent, reflective, self-aware life, namely us. And to me, the answer of God is a satisfactory answer to all of those, and it's one that respects the findings of science as well. And as a scientist, that is extremely important to me. I myself am a Christian, and I share your, your view of the universe and the world, that it is natural and that um, there is no real... Uh, evidence for or against God in the nature itself. But when atheists say that we need proof, and I want you just to um, say if you agree or disagree with this, uh, but I kind of get the idea that they want like kind of autograph right in the ground that says, I was here, God. Oh, I understand completely. And it's a very good point. And, and here's what I find interesting. And that is, this is what you just expressed is a point of view that the atheist shares with the fundamentalist Christian. And that is that the working of God should be obvious and even clumsy. And in that respect, that's one of the reasons why both fundamentalist Christians and many atheists insist that the story of natural history in the book of Genesis must be true for God to be real. That's one of the reasons why fundamentalist Christians oppose evolution, 
And it is also one of the reasons why many atheists use evolution as an argument against God. But I think ultimately um, what that argument does on both sides is to ignore the very sensible middle ground. And that is that the question of God is something that lies outside of the ability of science to answer. And that is the way that scientists and philosophers throughout the ages have traditionally thought about the question of God, and it's still the way in which I regard it with respect to science. At the Dover Kids Miller trial, did something specific convince Judge Jones that creationism is religion and not science? First of all, let me explain that the particular trial, the Kitz Miller trial of which you speak, went on for seven weeks. So this was a, a very long trial with much testimony. My own testimony in the trial took place only during the first two days of the trial. And naturally, I would love to say that I was the most important witness in the trial. <laughs> But I think that overstates my role. I'm not sure it does. I think you were. Well, we'll see. we can see about that. But I have to tell you that I really think the decisive evidence that was truly persuasive for the judge came from the work of another expert witness on our side of the case, a wonderful professor of philosophy named Barbara Forrest from the state of Louisiana. And Barbara had done research to show that the textbook purchased for students in Dover, um, and it was a textbook about intelligent design and about the idea of a designer for life. Barbara was able to show that that textbook had actually been produced from a creationist textbook in which God was referred to and which the word creation was used instead of the term intelligent design. And this is of pandas and people. That's You're correct. Gonna... What this led the judge to write in his opinions was that intelligent design cannot disentangle itself, cannot get away from its creationist roots. And it's important for your listeners in Sweden to understand that in the legal system of the United States, one court, the Supreme Court of the United States, um, basically controls or has the final say in judicial matters. And almost 20 years ago, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that creationism was in fact religious and therefore could not be taught in schools due to a violation of the American Constitution. So once the judge saw that intelligent design was also creationism, he was obliged to rule against the school board. Would you like to explain the similarities or relationship between creationism and intelligent design? I'm first and foremost thinking of the discovery that Barbara Forrest did and what, what happened to the book of Pandas and People in 1987. Sure, I'd be glad to. The advocates of intelligent design argue that intelligent design is different from creationism. And they use the word design constantly instead of the word creation. But think for a minute about what that actually means. If one says that the proteins that clot our blood were designed, or the animals that existed in the Cambrian period of geology were designed, one does not just mean that they were designed, one means that they were created. They were brought into existence by a power acting outside of nature, therefore a supernatural power. So taken at face value, intelligent design is actually a theory of special creationism. And in the Kitzmiller trial, it was demonstrated very clearly that the intelligent design textbook called Of Pandas and People had been produced by taking a book which explained creationism and by the simple act of calling the creator a designer. And that impressed the judge a great deal. The, the way in which I describe it is that the publishers of that book had a manuscript that talked about the creator and talked about creationism. And after a decision of the United States Supreme Court decided that creationism was religious, 
They simply took the manuscript, they fired up Microsoft Word, and they did a find and replace. And they replaced the word creator with the word designer, and they pretended that the book was entirely different. And in fact, it was not. So I regard intelligent design as simply an effort to relabel creationism, to make it more acceptable by calling it a slightly different name. It really uses every creationist trick it can to try to undermine the theory of evolution. And in many respects, you might say that's the real purpose of that book. When I speak to my Christian brothers and sisters in church, because here in Sweden, this thing with intelligent design is quite, well, not new, but it's kind of hip and cool right now. I'm sure it is. It's presented in uh, some Swedish books uh, that um, it's like a, a new kind of science that's uh, challenged the theory of evolution. Not that evolution is wrong, but may maybe we have um, gotten some things wrong about it. The thing that I want to say to most of uh, the people that it, uh, intelligent design is creationism in a new kind of disguise. And I think that's much what you said there, that this is the same thing. I believe that's correct. I think that's that is exactly right. My friend in the United States, Dr. Eugenia Scott, refers to intelligent design as creationism in a cheap tuxedo. And I think I think that's a very way, good way of putting it. This is uh, uh, from one of our listeners that says following. I saw an, a clip on YouTube where you held a lecture called The Collapse of Intelligent Design. And there you spoke of a man that himself was in favor of intelligent design. And uh, you spoke of if you expand the definition of science to fit intelligent design, it would also fit subjects like astrology. Would you like to explain that to our listeners, what you meant? Well, yes, I would. The man who is referred to in the video of that talk was Michael Behe. Michael Behe is a biochemist at Lehigh University in the United States, and he appeared as an expert witness in the Kitzmiller trial for the other side. He appeared in favor of intelligent design. And while he was testifying, he offered a very different definition of science than I would. And when he was asked about that definition, and our, the lawyer for our side said, you know, Dr. Behe, under your definition, astrology would qualify as science. To everyone's amazement, Dr. Behe agreed. He said, yes, under my definition, astrology would qualify as science. So he didn't see a problem with his definition then? No, he did not see a problem with his definition. And I mentioned that in the talk to illustrate that for intelligent design to be considered as a science, one would also have to consider astrology to be a science. And that's not just me saying it, that's an advocate for intelligent design, namely Dr. Behe. So that's the reason I brought that up in the talk that the question asked about. Again, from an atheist perspective, even though if we were created in some way, I would say that that knowledge isn't useful when you actually do science. I, I agree in a certain sense, and, and let me be very specific about this. I believe that the practice of science is the closest thing that we have on this planet to a universal culture. And, you know, I remember the, the bad old days of the Cold War and the Iron Curtain between East and West. I know Sweden was neutral, but... You knew about it, too. And at the time, in the 1970s, I struck up a collaboration with a group of scientists at Martin Luther University in Halle, in what was then East Germany, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik. And I finally, after many years of collaborating, met them at a conference, and we had a few drinks together. And one of the things that we mentioned was that the beautiful thing about science is there was not a communist version of the Krebs cycle and a capitalist version. That there was not one structure for myoglobin in what we used to call red China and another structure in Taiwan. And I feel the same way with respect to the question of theism. 
and that is science is done very well by Christians, by Muslims, by Buddhists, and by atheists and agnostics, because the unifying character of science is reliance on evidence and reliance on reason. And in that respect, the hypothesis of God doesn't come into play. So you're right. In that respect, it's not useful scientifically. But what that really means, very simply, is that human reason is a gift that we can all share, regardless of our religious beliefs. To maintain, as the question seems to, that the only useful ideas are the ones that are useful in science is to pretend that science can answer all questions. And I don't think it can. I think there are questions of beauty and questions of philosophy and art and even questions of history that science cannot answer by itself. And it requires other aspects of the human intellect and I think the question of God falls into that category. Have you always believed in evolution? And if not, has that affected your view of God and sure. the view of humanity when you started to believe in evolution? First of all, the, uh, I'm going to use the English word believe um, in a way that is like the German word glauben. I don't know the equivalent Swedish word. But when I speak to audiences in English, I'm always... I often say that I do not believe in evolution. I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in DNA. I don't believe in the atom. Because these things, to a scientist, are not a matter of believing. Rather, I accept the evidence for the existence of the atom. And I accept the evidence for the Krebs cycle. And I accept the overwhelming evidence for evolution. So to me, evolution is not a matter of faith. It's not a matter of believing. It's a matter of acting rationally and accepting the scientific evidence. Now, with the intent of the question, it basically would be, was I always convinced that evolution was true? And the answer, to be perfectly honest, is yes. Yes, from the very first time that I read anything in a science textbook or learned anything in my education about the theory of evolution it seemed to me obvious that the theory of evolution was correct in its essential form. So to be perfectly honest, there has never been a time in my life when I had doubts about the theory of evolution or thought that it was anything other than correct. So I, I, I think that's the simple answer to the question. Uh, I will tell you that um, it, not quite the same with my religious faith. Like many people who are Christians, I struggle with my faith. I have some difficulties from time to time, not because of the theory of evolution, but because of the things that I see happening in human society. The existence of war, of cruelty, of injustice. These things make me wonder about the question of God much more than anything in science does. And I have gone, I have changed my mind several times with respect to religious belief. I have come back um, to Christianity, as many people do after thinking about it for a long time. Um, and I think um, that tells you, in a way, that religious faith is an entirely different kind of belief from acceptance of science. And that's the point that I wanted to make. This is a hypothetical question. If new scientific evidence should come up that made creationism look true, or that uh, you found real evidence for creationism. How would that affect your view of God and science? Sure. Well, I'll answer that in a very simple way, and that is I'm a scientist. I'm interested in reality. I'm interested in the evidence. And if there is genuine evidence for creation, um, I would be forced to change my views. I think that's the only honest answer that any scientist can give. Um, however, I will tell you I this. I agree, absolutely. And that is that it has been more than 150 years since the publication of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. I can't think of any scientific theory that people have worked harder to disprove than the theory of evolution. And in that 150 years, not a single observation, 
or experimental fact, not one, has appeared that contradicts the theory of evolution. So, yes, if there was evidence for creation or intelligent design, I would embrace it. But given the fact that people have looked for such evidence for more than 150 years, quite frankly, I don't expect there to be such evidence. Uh, the rules are set up in a way that makes it much easier for creationists because they don't have to provide evidence, they just have to point out weaknesses and win by default. Yes, I, th I, th I think that's right. And if you read creationist books or this intelligent design book that we've talked about, you'll discover that they consist of a series of little arguments against various aspects of evolution, rather than a coherent scientific theory. And when we use the word theory in science, we are not talking about a, a hunch or a guess. We are talking about a whole series of ideas that explain experimental facts and observations in a unified way. And that is certainly lacking from any presentation I've seen of creationism or intelligent design. I saw you talking about Richard Dawkins, and I think that you were uh, talking about his view of religion, that uh, you said that sometimes he go over to uh, criticism of religion that is not based in science or something like that. I've said a lot of things about Richard Dawkins, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can remember the specific one you're talking about. First of all, I regard Richard as a friend. Um, we have shared a speaking platform twice. He has been very kind to me in promoting my own books. If you open The God Delusion, for example, which is his bestseller, you will find in the index that he does mention me, and he gives me two pages in The God Delusion, and they're very complimentary. He also mentions me in the preface to his latest book, which, at least in America, was published under the title of The Greatest Show on Earth. Again, in the preface, you will see my name mentioned, and it's a very complimentary reference. So I regard Richard as a friend. I also regard him as the greatest living writer on evolutionary theory. I mean, his book, The Selfish Gene, is a classic, and I recommend it to everyone. So I have very high, high regard for Richard as a scientist and a popularizer. I do think, however, that in many of his criticisms of religion, he takes a very fundamentalist view of religion. Um, he thinks in particular that religious faith is belief without evidence. And, and I really don't know of any thoughtful religious person who would accept that as a definition of faith. I also think that Richard regards religious faith as hostile to science, and in so doing, he ignores uh, really centuries of the history of the scientific revolution. It is a fact that modern science developed in Christian Western Europe, in many cases under the direct sponsorship of religious institutions. And therefore, the, the, the Christian view, which is a traditional one, that faith and reason are both gifts from God, uh, really explains much of how modern science came to be. So I think, um, you know, I, I have great admiration for Richard as a writer of science and as a scientist. Where I part company with him is I think he takes an overly simplistic view of religious faith and I think that simplistic view of religious faith is one of the reasons why he finds religion so threatening. Do you believe that Jesus turned water into wine, and do you believe that he walked on water and those kind of small miracles? Well, the, 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 my answer as a scientist is I have no idea. And the reason for that is I have no evidence at hand, nor do you, that we can judge scientifically. Um, I do know that turning water into wine is scientifically impossible. If there was a way to do it, I'd, I'd love to know how. I also know that walking on water, I was a competitive swimmer as a young man, and if I could have walked on water, I could have won many more races. So no, I know that's impossible too. 
So here's what I here's what I don't know. I do not know whether the gospel accounts are authentic in the sense that they record literally everything that Jesus did, or whether the authors of those accounts wanted to draw the attention of readers in decades or centuries later to the important teachings of a, of a life, of a person, who was so extraordinary that they wanted to make sure that people would read and pay attention and understand the teachings of Jesus. To me as a Christian, it doesn't matter. And what I mean by that is either way, the authors of the gospel accounts were writing about a person whom they believed was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And that is enough for me as a Christian, that I regard Jesus as the Son of God, as divine, and as the Savior of the world. And if those accounts are true, I can accept them. If the accounts are embellished because the authors of the Gospels wanted to make sure I understood that Jesus was my Lord and Savior, I accept that as well. Well, thank you very much, Kenneth Miller. Thank you very much. It's been an honor talking to you. It's been a pleasure answering your questions. Uh, please give my best regards to your listeners, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to your audience. Thank you very much. In the next interview, I will have fixed the problem with the mic. Sorry about that. If you like this and want to hear more, please subscribe, like, comment, and share. Until next time, take care.